afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Perry, and I'd like to welcome you to the first installment of uh, a pre-recorded Bible study that Infinity Church uh, is going to be offering um, for the next foreseeable future until we are permitted to gather back together again. Uh, Pastor Philip uh, is asking several of the Bible teachers within Infinity Church to pre-record uh, some Bible study lessons uh, that we can use and um, that will help us and encourage us and give us comfort and confidence during these difficult times that we find ourselves in, uh, in our world, in our nation, in our state, in our community today. So I want to uh, ask you, if you will, um, to, to take your Bible or your device Maybe grab a notepad and a pen and follow along as we do a chalk talk, talk today uh, on a subject that I think is very, very applicable to our world today. But before we do that, let's pray and ask God to bless this time together um, that we spend through technology to share and to build each other up with the very Word of God. Pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to open your Word. We thank you for the forum that we have available to us today, Lord, through technology, where even though we are unable to meet together and share with one another in person, Lord, we can share your Word uh, through technology. And Lord, you promise us that the Word of God will once spoken and presented, will do its good work and will not return void unto us. So even though this is an unusual way to preach the gospel, to teach the word, I pray your blessings upon your word today, Lord. Father, we pray for our leaders. We pray for our national leaders, our state leaders, our community leaders, and we pray for our church leaders here at Infinity Church, Lord. We pray for our family. We pray for safety for our family. We pray for health for our family. We pray for protection for our family. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and fill us with your spirit that will comfort and encourage and enable us, Lord, not only to go through this difficult time, but to reach out to others around us and lift each other and carry each other and be a blessing to each other as we go through uh, these difficult weeks ahead, Lord. Thank you for the Word of God. I pray your blessings upon it as we uh, talk about it and as we share it this afternoon. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want you to think about a word in our English language uh, the word is adversity. Now, when you first heard me state that word, and when you saw me write that word out on our whiteboard, there were certain thoughts that came to your mind. Um, for me, I don't necessarily like the word adversity. Um, to me, it conjures up kind of bad feelings, uh, maybe some bad memories. Um, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't roll off of our tongue as well as some other English words. Um, for example, our Infinity Church mission statement. Um, I love it, applaud, abide, advance. Those words just come readily, they roll out um, they have no negative connotation to them, but the word adversity just has that feeling to it. Well, if we look at Webster's Dictionary, we see that adversity is a noun, and we see that Webster defines it as misfortune, a wretched state, calamity, a 
and disaster. That is how Webster defines this word adversity. No wonder that we don't like that word in our vocabulary, much less have it in our lives. Let me ask the question, have you faced adversity in your life before? I know the answer to that question, and you know the answer to that question. Absolutely. I have faced adversity. You have faced adversity. There will be more adversity that we will face. There's been times in our lives when we have faced misfortune, that we have found ourselves to be in a wretched state of being. Uh, maybe we have been in the midst of a calamity. I love the quote by Charles Stanley, uh, the famous uh, pastor in Atlanta. Uh, Charles Stanley says this, about the word adversity. He says, adversity may be the detour or obstacle or storm that compels us to make life corrections. I like that. Adversity has a way of snapping us out of ourselves and getting our attention and, and riveting us, if you will, and making us, compelling us, as Stanley says, to really evaluate what is important in life and really assess what is true priority in our life and then have the courage and the determination to make those life changes. I'm going to tell you, a lot has changed in the last six weeks, has it not? If you were here with me in our classroom, we would have a lively discussion about the last six weeks in our world, in our nation, in our state, even here in our county, Greenville County. It can be said that COVID-19 is adversity in our national collective lives and in our personal lives as well. Social distancing, shelter in place, respiratory droplets, quarantine, exponential growth, live streaming, all new terms that are in my vocabulary that weren't necessarily there six weeks ago. And I'm sure that you have gotten familiar with these words and these terms as you watch your news and as you read your news. I don't understand this either, but there is a lot of emphasis on TP here in the Greenville area. I've heard stories from my own family about not being able to find TP. Folks, I don't get that, but maybe once this is all over, someone can help explain that to me. For me, it's not TP, it's diet right colas and coffee. Now, as long as Wanda can keep our kitchen and refrigerator filled with diet right colas and coffee, I'm good. I can make it. But once my diet right colas and my coffee is gone, then we'll have a, a real issue. On a serious note, we are dealing with adversity at this time. We're seeing sickness. We're seeing deaths. We're seeing concerns about our jobs. We're seeing retirement funds that have been depleted. We're seeing empty store shelves. And let's especially be in prayer for our healthcare workers and our healthcare industry as they are stressed, sometimes beyond capacity. We're seeing elective surgeries postponed. 
We're seeing church services canceled. That has affected us. Schools are closed. Parks are closed. Indoor dining closed. And the list goes on and on. It is enough adversity. There is enough adversity in our culture and population today to make us feel these human emotions, to make us feel uncertain, to make us feel unsure, to make us feel discouraged. And yes, if we allow it to even carry us to a place of feel fearfulness. I can tell you on the authority of God's Word and the very words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that although COVID-19 is very serious and although it certainly qualifies as adversity, I can tell you with certain authority on the Word of God that COVID-19 will not overcome our world. Let me ask you to turn to John chapter number 16 and look at verse 33. And here we see the very words of Jesus Christ as he says to us. He says this. He says, and I love the, the Living Bible translation for this verse. Here's what Jesus says. He says, I have told you all this so that you will have peace of heart and mind. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but cheer up, for I have overcome the world. Those are very, very important words to us as we work through this adversity. If you were studying that passage of Scripture, I would encourage you to write down key words like peace, heart, mind, earth, trials, and sorrows. The most important word is that word overcome. There's where we can have our confidence placed in the very Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, yes, we will have adversity in our lives. Yes, we will deal with certain issues. Yes, we will feel uncomfortable. But, rest assured, child, that's what Jesus is telling us, rest assured, I have overcome the world. We can find encouragement, we can find peace, we can find confidence in the one who has already overcome the world. Let me ask you to turn in the few minutes we have left, let me ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to ask you to turn to chapter number 4. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 9. So that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. The Apostle Paul gives us wonderful insight into the face of adversity. He gives us some great counsel and instruction and encouragement right in the middle of this adversity that we are now in the midst of. Just to build some context around the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this book in 55 to 56 A.D. He wrote this book about one year after he had penned 1 Corinthians, and he wrote this book while he was on his third and final missionary trip in Macedonia. And I want to give you a key theme in 2 Corinthians that we can pull out of the Word of God and apply it to what we are going through in this particular time in our lives. And that idea is endurance, endurance amidst adversity. 
adversity. This is a key theme that Paul writes throughout all of the book of 2 Corinthians. Paul's words were penned by him under the impression and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I submit to you today, some 2,000 years later, that these words recorded by Paul in 2 Corinthians with the, the theme being endurance ad, amidst adversity will still apply to us today. They are encouraging now as they were when Paul wrote these 2,000 years ago. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. Let's look at, I'm going to read from the, um, from the ESV translation. Here's Paul writing. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Wow, those are powerful words penned by Paul some 2,000 years ago. Do you feel afflicted? Do you feel perplexed? Do you feel despair? Do you feel struck down? I have to admit, there have been some anxious moments. There continues to be some anxious moments. Even doing this in this forum causes some anxious moments. Being unable to gather together, to commune, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. But notice Paul and his words of encouragement to us. There are three things that I think we can pull from these verses that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. The first thing that I want you to notice about this is that Paul never loses hope. He never loses faith, even though he had been personally in prison, beaten, physically attacked, had sickness, accidents, and had dealt with numerous other hardships. We know the story of the great apostle Paul. We know the hardships that he endured for his Savior, our Savior. And yet through all of that adversity, through all of that adversity in Paul's life, not once did he lose faith or did he lose hope. I think that's important for us. Do not lose your hope. Do not lose your faith. The same Savior that was with the Apostle Paul in his adversities is with us today in our adversity. Secondly, notice the same power that raised Jesus from the dead enabled Paul to endure the adversity and the trials and the sorrows that he went through. Notice there in verse number 7 as we read from the ESV translation. I love this. It, it, it says the surpassing power. Surpassing. That is a great word. Uh, the old King James uses the term excellency. The excellency of the power of Jesus Christ. Christ. Both of those terms have rich meaning for us today. The power, the surpassing power, the excellency of power belongs to God. It does not belong within us, folks. Our self-reliance is just that, self-reliance. What we need is God-reliance. So I'm, I'm going to encourage you to have God-reliance in your lives as we go through this together. I want you to also notice in verse number 7, we have this treasure. I love this analogy. I love this idea of treasure 
we have this treasure in jars of clay. I love that analogy as well. That is rich in its application for us today. The treasure here that Paul is referring to is Christ himself. The power that comes through a saved life through the resurrected Lord and Savior. I love that imagery, that analogy of the treasure that we have within us. The jars of clay represent just that. They represent our lives. We are just clay. We are easily broken. We are easily chipped. We are easily damaged. We are easily harmed. And that's the idea of the jars of clay. We have this treasure, Christ, and his surpassing power in our lives, even in the midst of adversity that faces us today. Henry Ward Beecher, the author of Proverbs from the Plymouth Pulpit, says it best. He says, Troubles are often the tools by which God uses to fashion us. We see that sometimes this adversity, God uses it as a tool to fashion us into something better for him. Thirdly, in these passages of Scripture, we see Paul's use of powerful contrast in life and adversity. Notice that he says he's afflicted, but not crushed. He is perplexed, but not driven to despair. He is persecuted, but not forsaken. And lastly, he is struck down, but not destroyed. Powerful words from the great Apostle Paul that he experienced firsthand in his life that we can take and apply in our lives. We need not be perplexed. We need not be struck down. We need not be driven to despair because we have Christ Jesus. And let me finish with three very simple yet profound truths that we can apply in our lives during this time of adversity, both personally, collectively as a church, collectively as a state, as a nation, and as a world. And we'll pull these from the writings of Paul. Number one, there are three weapons that we have at our disposal when we face adversity. Number one is the very Word of God. Let me encourage you. Don't watch the news and read the news 24-7. It will perplex you. It will strike you down. It will drive you to despair. Stay informed, yes. As citizens, we need to be informed. We need to have the welfare in mind of our neighbors, of our family members, our friends. Yes, but please, build your life's foundation on this Word of God. It is the only thing that will stand the test of time and stand with you. So we have, as a weapon, the Word of God that we can use. We can read it. We can claim God's promises because He cannot lie unto Himself. He cannot say something in the Word of God and then break that promise. So what He promises us, peace and comfort, even in the midst of our trials and sorrows, God will fulfill that promise. Secondly, past experiences. When Wanda and I got married in 1978, um, I finished up my last year of school in 79. Well, guess what was going on in the United States from 79 to 82? One of the worst recessions that we have had since the Great Depression of 1929 to 1933. So it was a very difficult time for Wanda and I as we began our marriage together and began our family together. Well, guess what? 
Wanda and I didn't miss a meal. God continued to bless us and provide for us and take care of us even in the midst of that difficult economical challenge at that time. We can rely on past experiences to help us have confidence and deal with the adversity that we face today. That is one of the real reasons that King David, as a young man, went down into the valley and bravely and courageously stood in the power, the surpassing power of God, and defeated the giant of Goliath. Um, it is because he had fought battles as a shepherd with bears and lions, and God had cared for him. Rely on past experiences to build confidence and encouragement in your life. And thirdly, the last weapon, the most important weapon, is earnest prayer. I'm not talking about a dear Lord prayer. I'm talking about an oh God prayer. And you know the difference, as I know the difference, between those two types of prayer. No, I'm talking about a Second Chronicles 7.14 type of prayer where we humbly seek the face of God. When we look at ourselves and we humbly seek His face and ask Him to intervene and to heal our land. Word of God, past experiences, earnest prayer. These are great weapons that we can use to encourage ourselves and those around us at this time. As we close, perhaps this is a time of reflection for us. Perhaps it's a time of self-evaluation. Perhaps it's a time where we need to reset our priorities and realize what is really important to us. I will never, ever again take for granted the uh, opportunity we have to assemble together and to be together and to fellowship and worship together as a Christian brotherhood and sisterhood. I miss you guys. I, I miss being able to talk with you and um, to uh, shake your hand and to hug you. I, I, I miss that. That's something that I bet we'll never take for granted again once we are able to reunite. Um, it may be that this is a time when we determine what is truly important to us, to ourselves, to our family, to our church, to our community. I'm not sure where you are spiritually today. I'm not sure where you are mentally. I'm not sure where you are emotionally. But let me assure myself and you that the Word of God and the authority of the Word of God can encourage you and it can give you peace and it can give you, uh, it can take away the anxiety and the anxiousness that we feel and it can bless us in our hearts and our minds. Though we through this treasure that we have in these earthly vessels, these broken jars of clay, through this treasure, we are not crushed. We are not driven to despair. We are not forsaken. And we are certainly not destroyed. Let me encourage you to be an encourager to those around you. Be a doer and not just a hearer only, but find ways to minister to others and in doing so, you will encourage yourself. You are not alone. We are not isolated. We may not physically be together, but we are certainly not isolated. Our church is thriving. We are innovating. We are finding new ways to minister, and we're finding new ways to do ministry. And I praise the Lord for that. It is Him and Him alone that we can trust in times of adversity. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the confidence. We thank you for the peace and the encouragement that it imparts to us when we fill our minds with it and when we implement it into our heart and into our 
very actions. Lord, I do pray, I pray, Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you as individuals, as a church, as a community, as a nation, as a world. I humbly approach you, Lord, and ask that you would intervene and that you would begin to heal our land. And may we, Lord, give you all the glory and the praise and the honor for what you do. In your merciful name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.